and the hunger coming in after games and we beat them in the dressing room and going, we're never going to win the, the league title by playing like this. He was driven. He just, the excitement. You wanted them to get the ball. You wanted them to be given it. And you can imagine Ronnie Moran on the touchline. Whoever was left back, give him the ball. And I said to Liverpool fans, you should not boo this boy. And you should not take the mickey out of this boy because he was a great player for us. Hello, I'm Jeff Stilling, and this is Football's Greatest. Each week, I'll be sitting down with a legend to discuss and debate some of the best exponents of the beautiful game. The players that got you off your seat, the hard men that made you wince, and the moments that will stay with you for life. In this episode, former Liverpool and England captain Phil Thompson is our guest. Phil's in paradise because he's going to give us his top five Liverpool players of all time. Phil, a, a difficult choice. We're going to come on to the ones that you've picked in a moment, but I just want to touch on one or two that you haven't picked. In your top five, mm -hmm. no defenders, not one. Is that because they don't live up to your own high standards? Probably, Jeff. Probably quite right there. But no, no Van that, Dyke, that, uh, no Andy Robertson, uh, no Alan Hansen, no Mark Lawrenson. Yeah, there was a host of players that you can pick from. You know, there's no Mo Salah in there. There's, there's absolutely no Luis Suarez, who's still Liverpool fans, still believe the greatest Liverpool player ever. I'll come on to that in, in a bit. But these are the ones, there's so many. There is so many, Jeff, you know, and ones that were come, coming across here, that no Kevin Keegan in there. So there's different eras that we can go right across. It was hard, but it's what, I believe, and it's what my, I look at, and I'll tell you the reasons when we go through them. Okay, and I'll come back to one or two of those names a, a little later. But, I mean, one or two of the names will surprise people. One or two of them go back a long way, including the player you have at number five. The number five has to be because he's my hero. And he is? And he's Roger Hunt, or Sir Roger Hunt, mm. as we nicknamed him on the cop. And it has to be that. And he was a goal scorer. He was a blonde legend. He was him and in St. John terrorised in St. John terrorised teams in the 60s. So you can imagine when it was your influential days as a fan and your love for players. And you always have one, don't you? And it was always more of a striker that you clung to. And I was no different. Roger Hunt was absolutely my idol. Scored two, 286 goals. And that's why he's also in there. He was the leading goal scorer. So all these things about it. Won the World Cup in 1966. Played in that final. So this makes him a legend, not just of Liverpool. And listen, when I got the chance to go to Liverpool in 1969 as an apprentice. He was still there. So you can imagine that worship. And they often say in life, Jeff, you should never, ever meet your hero. Why? Because they mightn't be the person that you thought they were going to be. Roger Hunt never let me down. Roger Hunt, then when we become friends, he was just... And so that love, that man love that I had for Roger has lived forever would he be a, a sort of just to pluck the name out of the air you might shoot me down a sort of callum wilson would he be the equivalent these days callum wilson you you can you consider my roger hunt with callum wilson he's a good player just in I'm terms too, of the type I know, of player but come on no but yes sort of goals from outside the box you don't see there's not sort of some of the great goals, because you look at Alan Shearer scoring so many goals, but we'll always remember with the Thunderbolts. Don't remember too many of Rodgers, because he was a poacher with his head, with his right foot, with his left foot, and we idolised him on the cop. He's still now there's a flag which adorns the cop on match days of Sir Roger. Mm. And that's how much we all think of him. And... Yes, there's a lot of players and people have become, well, why wasn't such a player in as your number five? You know, why can't I have my hero in there? Yeah. And that's it. He's, he is a Liverpool, proper Liverpool legend. So you played with the player that you have at number four. Yeah, I did do. And it's another one. Again, it's it's a goal scorer. And I, I think you have to have 
these guys in. You know, this this fella scored 346 goals for Liverpool at a wonderful time. You know, the sort of the 80s was just a really special time. And I seen this boy, and yes, it was Ian Rush. I seen this boy developed from a a shy, gawky young man to become one of the most prolific players that you could ever see. Him and Kenny Daglish relationship on a football pitch was uncanny, absolutely uncanny. And he developed into this confident uh, young man who his exploits on a football pitch was astonishing. He did score all kinds of goals. He could score volleys, right foot, left foot, headers. Um, I ended up nicknaming him, me, nicknamed him Tosh. And you go, Tosh, John Toshak, Welsh striker that we signed, brilliant in the air. Tosh, in his early days, never scored a goal with his head. Then he went on a prolific run of scoring with his head, hence my nickname of Tosh. And it stuck with him to today. If I was to ring him up, hey, Tosh, you're right. And we all knew who we were talking about, but he was wonderful, great pace, but he was a defender. You're probably going, oh, he's a defender. He was our first line of defence. Okay. And he started with him. He was like, he was like a cat in the forest. He would seek out his prey. He would like look the other way and he would allow these two centre-backs to give a sloppy pass. He would pounce and he would go. They talk about modern day high press. This fella was unbelievable at it. So he was like that, Jeff. So he had so much to his armoury. It was untrue. He's gone 346 goals. Somehow, some way, he has to be in my top five. But he came from Chester City. Now, that's the sort of thing that probably couldn't happen in this day and age. Was it obvious straight away that he had what it takes to make it at the highest level? No. <laughs> Quite easily, no. He's this shy lad, and he was found it difficult. And, of course... You had this uh, pecking order where you were in the the apprentices or the young professionals away team dressing room. You had all the pl- the, uh, the young pros and the, the senior ones all in the away t- in the home team dressing room. Rushy found it hard to get along it being in the home team dressing room with some big characters, and the Mickey taking and the banter was really heavy and hard. He found that hard to take, so he went found solace in the away team dressing room with the younger lads. So he found that was his his place. So it was difficult. And Rushy tells a story. He actually went in to see Bob Paisley and he wanted a transfer because he was finding it so difficult, wasn't getting a chance. And Bob said, you've got to prove your worth. You've got to get on with these lads and got to accept it. And he did in a great way. I remember one of his earliest games was the League Cup final replay against West Ham at Aston Villa's ground. Oh, my God. I th- I'm not sure whether one of the front lads was injured, but Ian played, and he, 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 it looked as though he'd been playing and he was in the first team for, like, for years. But he gave such an aclumpage that didn't score. We won 2-1, but, my goodness, it was the moment Ian Rush arrived and he just went on to greatness. Yeah. Um, the player you have at number three... Um, Peter Beardsley, another ex-Liverpool man, of course, said he is the best player I ever played with, bar none. I get that. Yeah, so tell us about him. It's John Barnes. And again, people are going, John Barnes. John Barnes was one of those players, and I get that sentiment of Peter's. And Peter was a great player himself. Absolutely wonderful. They signed at the same time. And I, I remember... Kenny, when he was telling me, he says, oh, I'm trying this, Peter Beasley. I wish he'd stop playing well for England. His price was going up all the time. I think we ended up signing for £3 million. And, but John Barnes come literally under the radar. It was all about Peter Beasley because he was really playing so well for England. But John was a good player. My goodness, when this player arrived, what a most wonderful human being he was. And he wasn't an aggressor. He wasn't anything. He went on to become captain of Liverpool. But if I can tell, I was reserve team manager at the time. And I'm, I'm like that. I remember going down to Coventry, one of the early games. And I've gone down there and met the players. The players gone overnight. But I'd gone. 
And I tra travelled down there, was in the dressing room, sat on the touchline, and I've watched this player. And he gave one of the most accomplished performances. And as Peter, Peter Beasley said, he just, the excitement, you wanted them to get the ball. You wanted them to be given it. And you can imagine Ronnie Moran on the touchline. Whoever was left back, give him the ball. Sometimes you hadn't even got the ball at your feet, but give it to Barnsley. Because he could just, and he would take people on. He would glide past people so comfortably. And he could dig a ball out from the byline for Aldo or Peter or find somebody to perfection. And when you talk about people who would get you off your seat to absolute enjoy a footballer because this was still a tough era and John was like that. And that's why third place for me, John has got to be up there. And yes, you could go and you'll probably ask me, but he just excited me as a player. I love my football and to see this guy playing for my club and then reinvented himself as a centre midfield player. But if you're looking at a wide player, Tomo, I'm just going to bring you right back to, to date now. Mo Salah, 140 goals in 225 appearances as we speak. Premier League title, Champions League title, twice a runner-up, FA Cup winner, League Cup winner, scored Liverpool's goal of the season three out of the last five seasons. Should Would I go you now? still put John Barnes ahead of him? Yeah. It was a time thing, Jeff. You know, when sort of you're looking for players like that, it was a tough era. You know, and the pitches weren't as good. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sorry for Mo, I, but it's a thing, don't you get, that it's present day. And when you're looking at legends and best players at clubs, sometimes you don't look at players now. But Mo, in years to come, we'll be looking. World Club Championship, you forgot about that. Golden Boot winner. Multiple times. World Club Championship does not count, Tomo. Doesn't count. Oh, how many times have Hartlepool won it? <laughs> well, the same as they've won everything else. None. Absolutely, Jeff. But, but well, unless listen, you're involved it in it, nobody else in football Jeff, is interested in the World Club Jeff, Championship. It meant nothing until we won it. Because <laughs> <laughs> when Manchester United won it, it, it didn't matter. But these things, Mo has been absolutely wonderful. And I've cherished all what he's done. But when I think, and I'm trying to think of 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 the best players, and I've left out a load, and Mo's one of the most modern day, and Mo would turn himself on, you've got social media and everything, and people will be rankled going, why is he not in there? I'm sorry, but it's it's present day, and I'm looking at players who, a lot, and it's, it has probably a, a lot more years than what, even Mo was at, at the football club. Now, thanks for watching Football's Greatest on YouTube. But can I ask you please to hit that subscribe button? That way you won't miss any of our future episodes and we have some great guests coming up on the show. This seems a good moment to mention one or two of the others that you haven't put in there. Yeah, I mean, no Michael Owen, for example. Is that just because he ended up at Manchester United? Uh, no, it's got nothing to do with that, Jeff. And I've, I've had this debate with a lot of... Liverpool fans and it was just the other the other day I was talking about this because somebody said oh that might go on going to Manchester United what did you feel of that and I said look I said Michael Owen was an incredible player for us he was a match winner for us he nearly Steven Gerrard has an FA Cup final after him Michael Owen should have his own against Arsenal when we were battered and I said, Michael Owen scored two goals to win us that cup. And I said, Michael Owen won us so many games and was he was Ballon d'Or winner. And I said, what you have to remember, he went to Newcastle when he should have been coming to Liverpool. He was, the deal was all done. And I said, but he chose Newcastle. And when he came to Liverpool and he got slated at Liverpool, where were you in Istanbul? And he took the mickey. Wrong. That wasn't nice. And then he joined Manchester United and he was booed at Anfield. And that upset me because I know Michael and I, know, and I know his family and how they would be upset. And I said to Liverpool fans, you should not boo this boy and you should not take the mickey out of this boy because he was a great player for us. If you don't believe in him signing for Manchester United and, and yeah, I get all that, that stuff, you don't have to boo him, but you don't have to cheer him. You just treat him as any other player, as though he's not on the football pitch. And I says, I would rather have that than the boy 
be derided because he just because he was playing for Manchester United. But people shouldn't forget what Michael did for us. Yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's obviously been a wealth of attacking players over the years. You mentioned Keegan and Beardsley, Robbie Fowler, Steve McManaman, uh, you know, Luis Suarez, and so on and so forth. <sighs> did, did, did Xabi Alonso come into your consideration at any stage? No, it's Xabi because Xabi was there long enough. Um, didn't settle quite quickly enough at Liverpool, uh, but then became a great player. And leaving Liverpool was one of one of Rafa's big mistakes, absolute big mistakes, because he had many more years left in him. And I think his legend goes that he he wanted to get rid of Xavi to bring in Gareth Barry. Gareth's a good player, but he wasn't a Xavi Alonso. Xavi had so much ability, knew the game inside out. His relationship with Stevie, Steve, Xavi to Stevie to Torres become legendary. And But no, I'm sorry, Xavi just didn't come into it. it, it I just want to touch on a, a couple more. One who's just left the club. And I'm just wondering, if we're having this conversation 10 years from now mm. and looking back, would people think that Bobby Firmino had been a Liverpool great? I know what you mean, Jeff. And get this, with, with Virgil van Dijk and great centre-backs, Bobby Firmino was my best player throughout this time. Bobby so excited me, twinkle toes. He was, he was the Ian Rush, if you wanted, of the trio of Sadio, uh, Mo and him. Bobby knew when, not just when, but how to press. So Bobby was wonderful. But would be he be in one of these... Probably not. And that sounds awful from a player who was my favourite as being a fan, as being an ex ex player. So it's a shame I didn't even want him to leave, Jeff, because he just he brought some money, some great memories. Uh, and, and just one last one. You know, you're never gonna put a goalkeeper in. I know you're not. But I mean you've had some great goalkeepers at Liverpool over the years, from Ray Clements to Bruce Grobelar. Again, I wonder if in years to come we look back at Alisson and think he was a Liverpool great. Yeah, I would think that might come in years to come, Jeff, because I think he's eased into he's been more last season was incredible. My Liverpool team and the year before that, we were so tight in defence. Alisson, yeah, good goalkeeper, we all just knew that. But last year, our last line of defence was called upon so many times to save us. And that wonderful headed goal that he scored at West Brom, that got us in the Champions League, that nearly won us because then we qualified for the Champions League because of that goal. If we'd have won against Real Madrid, that would have gone down as a legendary goal. And you forgot about that. Mm. But that would because we would never have been in that position. So anyway, it didn't happen. But yes. But Ray Clements has always been the greatest ever Liverpool goalkeeper for me, as good as Alisson's been. Let's move on to those who are in your list then. And at number two, well, when did you think, oh, this boy can play? It was, I, I remember seeing him in the very first game when I became assistant manager with Gerard Hulli. I went to a Leeds game, Leeds away at Ellen Road, reserve game. And I went and I'd heard a bit of hype about Stephen Gerrard and I'd heard the hype, as I mentioned, that I couldn't play twice a week. And I went and I seen this young lad sort of playing, but more around the centre circle, all that area there, just absolutely dominating the game. And he's playing this ball, wanting to play a 40 yard ball. And then, you know, he's keeping the ball, but he was snapping into tackles. He was going in and it, he was there, and you're going, ooh, this boy's got something here. Didn't think legendary status I thought yeah he's one that we can think of Paul Lynch let Paul Lynch left that summer and we were looking for a midfield player I can remember saying to Gerard Houllier I think we were playing at at, at Wolverhampton Wanderers in a pre-season game and coming back we were told who we can get and we were like that and he said you know got this fella Didi man at Newcastle we think we can we can get him. Didi six foot three, six foot four. She needed we thought tall, good somebody good in the air in midfield who could do a few things, protect the back four. And we were looking for a, a good header of the ball. Why we thought of Didi a man? Because he couldn't head the ball at six foot four. <laughs> he could do everything else, but he hated heading the ball. But I said to Gerard Hulier, don't let's discount this boy. I says, This boy, Stephen Gerard, is a player. 
And I said, he could do most things that we want. And he said, I think he's a bit young yet, Phil. And I got that. But after he played and when he started us coming on, I think it was against Blackburn, um, um, did I think he was going to have legendary status? Not at that point. But he went on and he grew into it. And it was just seeing this young man blossom and to be dragging my team and our club on his own at times to win games, to take us to trophies, was just fantastic to see him developing and his personality. And sometimes that anger and that hunger coming in after games and we beaten in the dressing room and going, we're never going to win the, the league title by, that, by playing like this. He was driven. Sometimes I looked and I thought, should I have a go? And say, you know, you're part of this or whatever. But I could understand his frustrations. And so you allowed that to, to go. But he did end up becoming a great leader. And Istanbul, the miracle of, you know, will be his, his there. And I know it's the FA Cup final against West Ham in Cardiff. But that game, Istanbul, how does that happen? It can only happen because of people like Steven Gerrard. He was a man for the big, big moments, wasn't he? Obviously, you mentioned the miracle in Istanbul. The the uh, the, the FA Cup final was at that game. I'd never seen a performance like it from, you know, a player who dragged the team single-handedly. The goal against Olympiakos, the hat-trick against Everton. You know, I mean, he was a man for the big moments, wasn't he? It was. And don't forget, he nearly left. Mm. Nearly left. They need to go to Chelsea. And, like, it was all sort of done and everything. And it was only his family when he sat down and he, he said, he said, yeah, you might go down there and you might win the league title, but having that medal in your hand and it's not with Liverpool Football Club, will it ever mean the same? And it was more his family that turned him and said, you need to stay. And he just turned it around like that. I can remember Rick Parry walked through the car park and I can and there was a camera, I think it was a Sky camera crew on Rick Parry and he just got the phone call from Stevie and he gave the interview. Then he said, Stevie Gerrard just rang me, said he's staying and wants to sign a new contract. I mean, all those wonderful moments. I wonder how annoyed and upset he gets when people talk about the slip against Chelsea that let Demba Barr in to score the goal and Chelsea on the way to a win, which ultimately would cost Liverpool the title. Because so many great moments and yet so many people remember him for that one them. slip. And he's, he's lived with it and he's, he's took it. And it, <laughs> I laugh about it. We played Leicester last week in the in the League Cup. Leicester fans singing the Stevie Gerrards. They're singing the slip. And oh. I'm going, where are these people? How did they come up? After all these years, they see Liverpool, they see Stephen Gerrard, they see the slip. And I'm going, oh, for my get a life, lads, please. <laughs> And it's, but that is where people look at Liverpool. They look at Steven Gerrard and they put the two together. Yeah. I do hope you're enjoying the show. I just want to tell you that you can follow us at, at Football's Greatest Pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. And search for Football's Greatest Pod to find us on X. Uh, we started your top five with uh, a sir in Sir Roger Hunt. Um, as he was known at Liverpool. And we're going to finish it um, because your number one is a king. Yeah. King and a proper knight of the realm. <sighs> no great shakes. Kenny Daglish playing with him, seeing this lad come from Celtic. And you'd heard about him at Celtic and how good he was. And you'd seen bits then. It wasn't so much on the TV as, as we got. Oh, my goodness. Talk about a player hitting the ground running. I can remember it. I think the first, I think we drew with Manchester United in the Charity Shield and you went, wow, this fella loves the ball to his feet in and around the box. He can make things happen. I think the first game of the season, we beat Middlesbrough 1-0 away. And this fella, and I, I, I still now can hear Ronnie, Ronnie Moran's voice in our ears. Give him the ball. Give him the, give it to his feet. That's all he kept doing. And it's Kenny, because he would back into people. He would turn and he could play, bring people. And he took over from Kevin Keegan, who'd left in 77 to go to Hamburg. And you're thinking, who are we going to replace him with? 
So we signed Kenny Dalglish. We think, is he going to be a Kevin Keegan? Oh my goodness. This fella was just, and Kevin could be very individualistic, but Kenny was the complete team player. He was there. He could bring players into play all the time, get the ball. He was scorer of great goals. And I tried to explain to people of more of a modern era of what Luis Suarez did. Because Louis was similar, backed into people, turned, nutmeg people, could bend the ball in from the corner of the box, left foot or right foot, great headers, absolutely. And this player would have you off your seat. So what he did for three years, Daglish did for 12 to 15 years. And I said, he was that good. And I says, he won more trophies than what Louis did. That's why he gets the legendary status. But it, he was the most complete player the thing with Kenny was, which people didn't know, he was so tough. He was so, he could put a foot in on a centre-back. He could leave a foot in. He could get angry and he would do it. I'd seen him at, at half-time in games. He'd have lumps kicked out of his legs and ice, Ronnie Morano, Joe Fagan on the knees and have these ice packs around and he's just chatting away as though nothing has happened. So he was everything. And... You look and becoming a manager, and I know we're not talking about it as a player, but it becomes a manager, wins two doubles. His influence on our football club is huge. On the city is huge. The empathy, the compassion that he showed after Hillsborough, him and his wife, was huge. The knighthood came a bit late. His wife with the Marina Daglish appeal, breast cancer. We now have a wonderful Wonderful place in Entry Hospital, like a five-star hotel. The people who got the chemotherapy, every they were in on beds, in corridors. And this couple, absolutely. So the things that they've done, I know I'm di sort of moving away from what he did as a football. As a man for the, our football club and our city, <sighs> absolutely different class. What was he like in the dressing room at those times, Tomo? Because he was... No fan of the media, that is for sure. <laughs> we we know now he's got this fantastic sense of humour, but at times he came over a bit defensively, it, it, you know, to the public. But what was he like in that sort of inner sanctum? He, he, he was great. He loved the laugh. He did. He loved the crack in the dressing room and the laugh. Friday nights in hotels, there'd be him and Graham in one bed and me and Terry Mack and what me and me and Terry Mack would always end up in their bedroom and the laugh that we'd have Kenny would always take a sleeping tablet because he'd always and he'd already have took it by the time and he'd be going like that and he'd be falling asleep but the laugh that we had so he joined in on all the banter and people got how can you understand them and because we were with them all the time it, we didn't find it really a problem but he was full of humour full of a great crack but he was a family man. He loved his family. That was, and he didn't like anybody. So becoming a manager and having that more profile, he didn't like it particularly, and he would hate it. Do you know why he was like that with the media? He was there. If Kenny would be thinking, you could see him thinking, I know what you're going to ask me. and I know what I'm going to answer you back. And then I know what you're going to ask me off the back of that. And I know what I'm going to come back to you with. And then you're going to think, and you could see this in Kenny's face. He was always wanted to be one step ahead. He did it because he loved his club. He came to Liverpool and has immersed himself in our city. And he was protective of his players, of his football club. And I would say it was like Sir Alex Ferguson. The thing that he valued was his club and his players and would protect them. I know the years we've seen some wonderful players, you know, people now will talk about Messi and Ronaldo. If you look further back, we talk about Pele and Cruyff and, and Maradona. If I was asking you to be listing the five greatest players in world football, not just the five greatest Liverpool players, would Kenny Dalglish be a contender? <sighs> Probably not. Not in that sort of those realms, for the reason he never got the opportunity to do it on the big stage. Scotland did qualify, but never done themselves real justice. Was Kenny sort of, did he do it greatly for the national team? 
Probably not. And I think that's where maybe that greatness, what we see in the players that we're talking about there, because when he, he went with Scotland to the World Cups and everything, of course, people were talking about the, all these great players. And Kenny never, ever sort of stepped up and influenced them, particularly like Maradona did, you know, and even Platini at the time. He, they didn't sort of, they didn't grip you. Kenny didn't grip you. And maybe that's why, I would have to say, and on heart, that he doesn't sort of fit in there. Okay. But number one in your Liverpool top five. Tomo, thanks very much for sharing your Liverpool top five with us. Next time on Football's Greatest. And I feel for, for Aaron Ramsdale massively um, because he's done absolutely nothing wrong. Should be playing. Should have, even if he didn't, even if he did get left out, off the back of how David Ryan's played, he should be straight back in that side but he's not. So for me, that tells you straight away, that tells you the whole story, that for me, Aaron Ramsdale's future at Arsenal is finished. Join us again next time if you can. Football's Greatest is a folding pocket production with BBC Studios.